Question 6 from the 2023 Higher Physics Examination from the SQA, Paper 1. A satellite of mass 628 kilograms is placed into an Earth orbit of radius 23,000 kilometres. The mass of the Earth is given as 6 times 10 to the power 24 kilograms and the gravitational force that the satellite experiences from the Earth in its orbit is, and you're given your five responses. OK, a picture of what's happening. There you have the planet Earth. We have its mass. We have the mass of the satellite. And we have the radius of the orbiting satellite taken from the centre of the Earth to be R. And R is 23,000 kilometres. That's the first fault that people can fall into. 23,000 kilometres must be changed into metres to do the calculation. Looking up, we have the value of g, and g, the universal gravitational constant, is 6.67 times 10 to minus 11 metres cubed per kilogram seconds. The formula to work out the gravitational force between two bodies of mass m1 and m2, separated by a, a distance of r squared, is given by that expression there. So all we have to do is really plug in the numbers for that, and if we plug in the numbers, we should get this particular expression here. Now it's very important to remember that the radius is given in kilometres. So the 23,000 kilometres to change it into metres, you just multiply by 10 to the power 3. And remember it's got to be squared as well as some people forget. So once we've done that particular part of our work, all we have to do after that is just do the answer and we get the following. We get the force of attraction between the two uh, bodies is going to be 469 newtons. We round it up to two significant figures to give us 470 newtons and in the responses they give in scientific notation. So 470 newtons comes out to be 470 times 10 to the power 2 newtons and the answer to that it looks like it's going to be answer A so our answer in the scheme would be A Question 7 from the 2023 Higher Physics Paper 1 Muons are created in the upper atmosphere of the Earth. The mean lifetime of these muons in their frame of reference is 2.20 microseconds The muons are travelling at 0.99 C and relative to the observer on the Earth. The observer measures the mean lifetime of these muons to be one of the following responses. A little picture to show us what's happening. We have the observer on the Earth, the green uh, semicircle representing the Earth, and the spacecraft representing the muons frame of reference. And if we measure the lifetime of the muon in its own frame of reference, ACA, its spacecraft, we measure T. But if you're an observer measuring that same lifetime on the Earth as the planet, as the spacecraft whooshes past you with a speed of 0.99 C, then you'll measure the different time. You'll measure T prime. And T prime is given by the following expression. It's time dilation. T prime equals T, the time proper time measured by an observer in the muons frame of reference divided by 1 minus v upon c all squared. So if we do that calculation we end up with the following, we can put in our numbers and we can see that t prime is going to equal to 2.20, remember it's a microsecond so you have to put in times 10 to the minus 6 and you can divide that by 1 minus and the v divided by c all squared you'll see that the c squared cancel out, the c squared cancel out, and you're just left with 0.99 squared. Now we do that with a calculator, we end up with a value of 1.56 times 10 to the minus 5 seconds. And that's going to correspond to letter D for a response. So for question 7, we have a time dilation of D, 1.56 times 10 to the minus 5 seconds. Question 8 from the 2023 20, Higher Physics Examination Question Paper 1. Evidence supporting the existence of dark energy comes from, and now we're dealing with dark energy, it comes from A, the estimations of the mass of the galaxies, the darkness of the sky, Olbers paradox, C, the large numbers of galaxies showing redshift rather than blue shift, D, the accelerating rate of expansion of the universe, and E, the abundance of elements hydrogen and helium in the universe. Well, response E, the abundance of elements, hydrogen and helium in the universe, point towards the Big Bang. 
D, the accelerating rate of the expansion of the universe. Well, that does point to dark energy because we don't know what is causing this uh, increasing acceleration of the universe. And the only way to describe it is to say there must be some sort of energy out there. I mean, physicists talk about unknown energy. They usually put dark in front of it. So it's dark energy which we go towards as evidence supporting the accelerating rate of the expansion of the universe. So the answer to number eight would be D. If we look at C, it says large numbers of galaxies showing red shift rather than blue shift. Well, it just tells us that the galaxies uh, are moving away from us. Space time between is expanding. So actually for the expansion of the universe. The darkness of the sky once again points to the Big Bang Theory. And A, estimation of the mass of the galaxies. Well, there's an underestimation. We know that there's going to be less mass visible than what's out there from observations. So we have to rely on dark matter. But the question is asking about dark energy. And it's the accelerating rate of the expansion of the universe. Which we have to point towards evidence supporting dark energy energy. Question 9 from the 2023 Higher Paper 1 Physics. A student makes the following statements about the emitted radiation from stellar objects. And there's your three statements here. One, the peak wavelength of the emitted radiation is longer for hotter objects than for cooler objects. Statement 2, a blue star is likely to be hotter than a red star. And for statement 3, the radiation emitted per unit surface area per unit time is greater for hotter objects. Now, to answer this question, you must be really sure of your black body diagram, the black body curve. So we'll now go to the simulation from PHET to verify these three statements. So here's our black body diagram, our black body radiation curve for a black body. And along the x-axis is the wavelength, measured in micrometers, and up the y-axis is called the spectral power density, but we just need to know that it's going to be the, the amount of power per meter squared for every wavelength. So what this graph does is it's taking every wavelength from that particular black body source and measuring the amount of power per meter squared that's radiated from it. Now you can see that we're sitting just below the temperature of the sun and as we make the black body actually warmer you can see that the peak radiation is moving towards the short wavelengths. So we can do that by adding in the labels from the graph here and also the graph values. So we can see from that little spot, that white spot there, that if we increase the temperature the peak wavelength is actually becoming smaller. So the peak wavelength is becoming smaller, but another important thing to notice is that the actual amount of energy given off uh, in watts per meter squared, you can see that the hotter object becomes, the area of that black body curve gets bigger, and it's giving off more and more radiation per meter squared, more and more joules per second per meter squared. So a couple of things you've got to know about this one now. As we increase the temperature, the wavelength of the peak radiation moves towards the smaller wavelength and the area of the graph gets bigger, therefore you're going to have more energy uh, per second per meter squared being given out from that particular body. Now if we go back to our responses, we have the following. So our responses are the student makes the following statements about the emitted radiation from stellar objects. One, the peak wavelength of radiation is longer for hotter objects than for cooler objects. We're just showing that's not the case. So statement one is false. A blue star is likely to be hotter than a red star. We know that a blue star has got, is giving off radiation with a smaller wavelength than red light. So therefore, that is likely to be hotter. So that one is correct. Statement two correct. And the third statement, the radiation emitted per unit surface area per unit time is greater for hotter objects. And that was the case as the object got hotter and hotter. You can see the area of the graph in, in fact increased. That meant you were giving off more radiation per unit unit surface area per unit time. So therefore, number three is in fact correct as well. So two and three are correct out of that, which gives us an answer of E for question nine. Question 10 from paper one of the 2023 Higher Physics Examination from the SQA. Which of the following diagrams represents the electric field pattern between two identically positive charged particles? Well, first of all, the electric field is shown by these lines. And these lines show you where a small 
positive test charge will experience a force and in what direction that force will be in. It can be summarised by this little diagram here. You can see the positive charge and surrounding it is the electric field and you can see that the electric field lines are all pointing away from it. And that tells us that if you bring a little small positive charge near this bigger positive charge, it will experience a radial force away from the positive charge and in the direction away from it. So all the arrows must emanate from a positive charge going away from them. Now, that gives us quite a bit of a problem. If we look at number A, letter A, we can see that letter A, these lines are going away and these lines are coming in to the positive charge. Remember, that's going to be wrong because it's got to be, the field lines have got to show you where a positive charge would experience a force in what direction. And these arrows are pointing in towards it, which tells us that a positive charge is going to be attracted to that positive charge and that's wrong. Uh, part B is the one because we can see that all the field lines are pointing away from the positive charges like that and there seems to be this area in here where it's almost you can intuitively see that the two positive charges are repelling each other. So B stands to be the correct one so far. Let's just look at the rest of them to see if, if there's any other ones which maybe could conflict that. Well, let us see, once again, we rule that out because if we put a small positive charge here, it isn't going to experience an attractive force towards the positive charge as indicated by those arrows. So C is going to be false. Letter D, the diagram D, you can see, we could argue it could be this case, but it falls down because even though all the radial field lines point away from the positive charges, it's this bit in here. If you were in this part here, it would seem to be you're going to be pushed along towards this plus part here. And that's not the case because you must have repulsion. And that diagram there looks almost like the field lines that have been attracted to each other. So that rules out D. And this one here, once again, the big clue is the field lines are pointing uh, towards the positive charge and that's not the case because the field lines represent the direction and the size of the force which a small positive test charge would experience and they certainly don't attract, they've certainly not been attracted to the positive charge, so we rule out E here. So the correct one is going to be diagram B, showing you the repulsive nature of the two positive charges in all its glory.